So as we gather together this morning, we're going to continue the story that connects us together, the story of us. We talked about the need of salvation through Jesus and the reason why. It was because we fell into sin. Human beings did. Man allowed for Eve to fall into that sin and he indeed fell into sin too because he didn't take full of that accountability for what he went through. And so we talk today about, well, what does that look like? Especially when we're accepting Christ, when we're in a time and a season in which we are given this opportunity to accept Jesus as our personal Savior, what does that look like as we continue to grow spiritually? And so we look at Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to go one through verses 1 through 9 and then 18 through 23. And to set the stage for you, Jesus had been preaching. Uh, he had been preaching in his in his home, and the house was so full, and things were going on. And people told Jesus' family about what was going on. They came in to tell him to stop, and he said, "No, no, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop. These are my people. The, these are the ones that need to be heard." And so he tells them in chapter 13, starting with verse one. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it. While all the people stood on the shore, he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he scattered the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because of the soil, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seeds on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever hears... Let them, whoever has ears, let them hear. And so Jesus goes on in this time of the parables and the, His disciples ask Him, Jesus, why do you speak like this? Why do you talk in parables? And Jesus explains, you know, not everybody that has the ability to hear or doesn't really listen to what is said. Those that have eyes don't necessarily see what's going on. Those that are given the message of truth don't always process the truth. And some of that has to deal with how they have been told in their life how to understand what a spiritual life looks like. Now, blessed are you for you have been with me. You have seen these things. I have taught you. But in this time, let's speak to them in a way in which they understand. And then this is one of the few times in which Jesus goes on to explain a parable. A lot of times you'll say the parable and we have to, I I can just imagine the people of that day taking what the message that he gave gave and applying that to how God acts in their life. Because I know even in the, the times we live in, when we read these parables, we really have to have a lot of Bible study and discernment to, to really grasp what it is that God is talking to us about. But here, Jesus takes the time to explain to his disciples. He says in verse 18, Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed that was sown on the path. We evangelize a lot. We have for 2,000 years. But there's more to evangelism than just saying you need Jesus or else you're going to hell. Evangelism has the aspect of sharing the gospel, but then also the encouragement of those who have accepted Christ to be able to teach. Often think of uh, in, in Acts about Philip and how he was placed in that situation with the the eunuch and the eunuch had the scrolls and Philip's like, hey, can you you know what you're reading there? I'm reading it, but I don't understand it. No one will teach me. And Philip takes time to teach him. So he would have an understanding and that 
uh, Ethiopian eunuch went and took that message back to his people in Ethiopia. We need to take time for discipleship in our evangelism, or else the evil one will snatch it away. It'll snatch away these messages. Of, it'll go in one ear and out the other, as my mama used to say. The seed falling on the rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble and persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Brothers and sisters, we've, in the past 30 years, there's been a theology about prosperity gospel. That's dangerous stuff, y'all. It's dangerous stuff. It's dangerous because we're always going to be faced with trouble. It's not about earning merit. It's not about if I do this, God's going to do this. It's about being humble in your devotion to Christ and allowing Christ to work in you for there to be salvation. Because hard times are going to come. And there will be times in which you will be accountable for being a Christian. Stand firm on your faith. And when you do, you will see how God is working in your life. There are many people that just run or they feel that they were lied to by the, by the church because they did everything they were supposed to do, but it didn't work out the way they wanted, so therefore they're not going to worship God anymore. Or they get into a sticky situation in which they really need to stand firm on their faith, but instead they do like Peter and deny Christ. Now the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the difficulties of wealth choke the difficulties of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. I love church. I love church. God has given us a wonderful opportunity to be connected together. Christ says upon this rock, this message of faith, He builds His church. Christ builds His church on what? A rock. He doesn't build it on money. Too many times through Western civilization over the course of a few centuries, money has become the root of all evil in churches. And it has crushed the Spirit of God, at least in the hearts of people. God's Spirit can't be crushed, but the hearts of people have been crushed. And then Jesus says, But the seed that falls on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. These are the people who have received the message and the gospel of Jesus and it has taken root and they have had good people to surround them and nurture them and help them through a time of discipleship to where they have grown and in their growing they have been able to share a message of the gospel and they have been able in that message of sharing for others to hear that message and also accept Christ in their life and this has been going on for more than 2,000 years this is a firm foundation because what we need in church is a firm foundation we need the foundation of Christ in church Christ uh, talked about a parable about two men who were building a home one decided to just start building it was on sandy soil the other took time he made sure that he had a, a rock a pillar to build upon so he would have a solid foundation and Luke's account in chapter 6 it says they are like a man built like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on a rock and when I like that when a flood came and the torrent that means the big wave struck the house because I love how it says when it didn't say oh by the way oh and this seemed to happen no it said when this happened it means it's going to happen you are going to face trials and tribulations. I have yet to read anywhere in God's holy scripture where life is a bed of roses once you have accepted Christ. Now Christ is with us. He gives us the promise He'll be with us. He'll give us the promise that He will be with us even till the end of the age. All the step of the way that we can take on His yoke and the burden is light. 
so we can overcome those times in which the torrent hits. The flood's going to come. And the the torrent struck the house, but could not shake it because it was built well. It had a solid foundation. A house that's built on sand cannot stand the flood and the torrent. It's often said that it takes a village in order to raise a child. And that's true not only for children, but it's true for adults too. This is that connection of us. It takes God's church, brothers and sisters, for us to continue to grow spiritually in Christ. To get back to that very good creation that God designed us to be in. When we think about Moses and the Israelites, when the Israelites are uh, delivered out of Pharaoh's hands, when they have this new life and Moses is leading them, God calls Moses to go up on the mountain to spend some time with him. And as he's spending time with him, he gives him ten commandments. And these commandments are a guidepost for the Israelites to live by. This is a guidepost for them to have. This is the, the message of, you are my people, I am your God. Here is what we will live by together in covenant with one another. This is what will set you apart from all the people in the land. This is what will set you apart from the Egyptians that I delivered you from. This is what's going to set you apart from these people living in Canaan. This is what's going to set you apart from everyone in this earthly realm of the world and their lifestyle because you are willing to follow these guidelines, these posts, these commandments that I am giving you. You are willing to say that I am your God And in so, here is what I'm telling you. You will have no other gods. No other gods. You just need Yahweh. You just need God. You don't need to worship these foreign gods of the land. You just, who's the one that delivered you? God. You will have no other gods. Do not make idols of worship. All these other people, they make these idols to to worship and pray to. You're not going to do that. And I understand in the the times that we live in, there's there's a big debate, especially in modern churches being built. Sometimes you don't find crosses or pictures of Jesus because they feel that that's idolatry. And it's not. The iconography of a cross or a picture of Jesus, that's our remembering what Jesus did for us. When it comes to idol worship, and that is the aspect of a human being trying to take the symbol of that idol and manipulated it, and manipulating it to one's own good and purposes. That's witchcraft. That's paganism. God says, no, I am your God and you are not pagans. You are not those people. You do not pray to these idols. And one thing, definitely, you do not manipulate me. For I am your God, and I shall not be manipulated. For we are, if you are humble in heart with me, Christ says, if I abide in you and you abide in me, we grow together and you will bear much fruit. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Now that's more than just saying a wordy dirt now and then. Okay? That is, if you're going to be a Christian and stand up for being a Christian and do the things a Christian is supposed to do, then do that. Don't do things of your own accord and say it's in the name of God. We have done that for centuries, human beings have. And it's always turned out for bad and evil purposes. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. And then observe the Sabbath. Oh, God tells us to take a day off. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it great? How many of us do it? You know, it's more than just taking this time off. It's to enjoy what God has blessed you with. When God created the world, when it got to the seventh day and God rested, He did not say, oh, I'm tired. Oh, no. He wanted to take a moment and reflect on this very good creation to enjoy what was created. God has given you many blessings, so take a moment sometime in your work week to have a time of Sabbath. 
to reflect on what God has done for you. Honor your father and mother. Honor your father and mother. Honor your father and mother so that you may be prosperous in the land that God has promised you. We often leave off that last little tag. When you honor your father and mother, you are given a promise that God will prosper you in your heart and in your life. Do not murder, self-explanatory. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. That's more than just saying don't don't tell lies. Don't don't be a gossip. Don't say things that there is no foundation of truth for. Don't allow for words to be twisted around that can condemn a person before a person can even defend themselves or have evidence brought against them. Don't give false testimony. And do not covet the things of your neighbor, the wife or anything else. No servants, no livestock, do not covet. Brothers and sisters, we live in a time, especially since the invention of radio, where coveting has been thrown at us all the time. Advertising is nothing but inspiring us to covet, to want to keep up with the Joneses, as they say. The reason we don't covet is because we are to be satisfied in God's blessing. Now, we can be satisfied in God's blessing, but still have goals, still want an aspect of to do more or to, to be more, to be better in Christ, but we need to be satisfied in what God gives us in the season that we're in. See, these are the building blocks for society. Even if you were to take out the first three commandments, this is a good structure for society. If you were following uh, all those from uh, four through ten, you would have a great society. Well, a good society, I'd say. You have a great society when you add those first three. Jesus, when he was asked which of these commandments were the greatest, what he did was he actually simplified everything. He simplified it in this, in his account in Matthew 22, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest in the first commandment. Take those first three. Have, there's only one God. You'll have no other gods. Don't worship idols. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. That is all aspects of a true and holy love that sets you apart from others. Do that with everything that you got. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second is like this. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now take four through ten. Compile those together. That's loving your neighbor. You say, really? Even observing the Sabbath is loving your neighbor? I'm going to let you in on a little secret, y'all. It's not really a secret for those that know, but in common Jewish faith, when they take their Sabbath on a Saturday, and you, who do not practice Judaism, go over to their house, they do not ask you to do anything. Even though they're not even allowed to go and flip the light switch off because that's considered work in their, their faith system, they won't ask you to do it. Even though they need to turn that light off, they want to turn that light off, they will not ask you to do that because you will fall into sin. Brothers and sisters, on Sunday, how many of us go out to eat? How many of us? Let's be honest. We go out to eat. You know, this is supposed to be the Sabbath. But yet we're asking someone to wait on us. I understand that things have changed in culture and society. And I understand the aspect of it would be really hard to just stop everything and put things to a halt to go back to all of us taking our Sabbath on Sunday in such a way. I understand that. But I also want you to understand the reason why it's continued on on Sunday is all about the dollar. It's all about profit. And there are those that, that work on Sunday that need that extra money now. This is where sometimes they get their extra money. But a business can be profitable without having to be open on the Sunday that we take as Protestants. You, know, you look at Chick-fil-A, you look at 
uh, CMH Homes, you look at very profitable multi-billion dollar companies. Don't open on Sunday. So if you are going out to eat, because again, we'd have to get out of the mindset of not going out to eat. Because a lot of us don't do like we used to do way back in the day and have that casserole already set and ready or, or have everything prepared where we can just go to the house and cook and everybody come over. But if you go out to eat, treat your staff well. Okay? Because I know I've been in restaurants I don't know how many times after church and I usually get there at the tail end by the time I finish and and change clothes and everything. We get there at the tail end, and those that staff is wore out because they have waited on people that have been in church but have not acted like they've been in church. All right? So treat your staff well. Treat them well. It's important for us to love our neighbors in such a way. It's important for us to love our neighbors. If we love God with everything that we have, all these commandments just fall into place. If we, if we truly, with our whole heart, love God with everything that we have, all the other commandments just fall right into place. This is the foundation through Christ that we are given to lead lives that will be strong, to lead, lead lives that we can share the message in the gospel. You know, Christ says with these good seeds that take root, there will be a huge harvest. If we think about a kernel of wheat, just a kernel of wheat, and it's planted and it shoots up, that plant will have three heads on it. And on each of those heads usually is about 13 to 15 kernels of wheat. Now, if we were to take that on the higher end, that's about 100 kernels per stalk of wheat. Now, if we were to plant all those kernels and they were to produce stalks of wheat, we, then they have the potential of producing 10,000 kernels. And if those 10,000 kernels are planted and, and come up and are nurtured and they produce, then there will be 1 million kernels out of all that. It's amazing to see what an impact this we can have on this world if we take time to not only share the gospel, but to nurture we have a hymn in our hymnal called "It Only Take Pass It On," and it, it says it only takes a spark to get a fire going, and that's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, because you want to pass it on. In this story of of us, we are called to pass on the message of Jesus Christ, to pass on this joy that we find in our hearts, to continue on. To help others on their journey and their walk with Christ. So that way we can continue to build a community that has a strong foundation in Jesus. And when we do that, there is so much potential for that to grow. We just have to be the ones who are willing to make sure that we have hearts that are open and fertile to receive the full message in the spirit of Christ. And to be able to take that message and share it. We can do that. We can do that. We can get outside the walls and do that. I'm not talking about necessarily going door to door like you used to back in the day. And, and having those kind of evangelism type efforts. I'm just talking about sharing Jesus with those that you, you see at the restaurant. Share Jesus with those that you see at the supermarket. Share Jesus with your classmates. Share Jesus with your co-workers and share Jesus with your family. And make yourself a living sacrifice. That's what it says to do. Easiest way to make yourself a living sacrifice is just to smile. I pray that we don't have to go back to a full masking because the smile is something that really brightens a person's day. So share your smile with others. It makes a difference. It makes an impact. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And love your neighbors as you love yourself. When we share love, it makes an impact. And when we share love, it builds a foundation of faith and community. Let us pray. Lord, 
Help us to be a community together in the spirit of your mercy, grace, and love. Help us to share the love of Jesus with those that we meet so that there can be a firm foundation in which your church is built. In Christ's name, amen.